So I'd like to start with saying thanks to Katrina, but any faults are just mine. So I did make some incredibly bold statements in the abstract about exposing, embodying and promoting a new paradigm, and stand by that 100%. What I'm going to do today is define it, demonstrate it, discuss it. So the optimum goal is to find as much about the past out as possible, and we'll use whatever way we can to do that. Genetics, just a tool. Traditional archaeology, just a tool. Linguistics is a tool. And the list goes on. So here's a few key words at the bottom. We can talk more about those later, if you so wish. So it's multidisciplinary, really. Um, in previous occasions and in my own studies, I've uh, looked over the origins of the Celtic languages, the archaeological manifestation. I wanted to find out what that was, because Celtics Indo-European had to consider Indo-European origins and spread. And um, I concluded that it originated in the Bronze Age, either the Beaker Bronze Age or the Atlantic Bronze Age. I also had to consider whether Celtic originated in the West, where it was historically attested, or whether it originated with Latin in Central Europe. And it, was, it does seem to have been Celtic from the West. That's the Atlantic facade. That's the area where um, Celtic languages have historically been known. Uh, so just to reiterate, on the, um, the grey picture there, uh, you see a population movement from Pont Caspian Steppe. That's the area just north of the Pontic, aka Black and Caspian Seas. You see a population movement. That's been taken as a proxy for Indo-European languages. We can talk more about that later. And uh, when it gets to the west of Europe, it's really strongly associated with this so-called Bell Beaker culture. <clears throat> so, I'm going to talk a little bit about John Cox's idea for Celtic origins. He mentions a lot of this site called Ross Island, which is just here, um, in Killarney. And... That was arsenic copper. In the Greek language, arsenic means strong. Because arsenic was in the copper, it was very strong metal, which was good for the artifacts. It was good for the metallurgy. The resources were not infinite. They got depleted. People wanted to imitate that. Also, through archaeological chemistry, that was widely exported to Europe, the stuff from Ross Island. Um, it's, hypothetically speaking, that inspired... Uh, a new Bronze Age. Not the first Bronze Age in Europe, but an independent invention of Bronze Age. And potentially, hypothetically, Celtic was a lingua franca facilitating those contacts. So, we'll just get on to the uh, discussion now. I've done the demonstration, but I will go back to a few points raised. Culture history. Um, is it condemned? The answer is no. It's flawed, but it's still in use. So, the main thing that people have against culture history is that it's rigid. That it has a history of nationalistic manipulation. Uh, Mallory's position is that to deny any kind of correlation is just as bad. I think just any rigidity, or any politicisation for that matter, is the bad thing about it. So I'm using culture history, but I'm doing it in a fluid way. So just to demonstrate that, Go back to this one. Well, the Bell Beaker culture, archaeologically, that material culture, is thought to have orig originated in Iberia. And that was prior to this spread from the Pontic Caspian Steppe. Furthermore, the metallurgy from Ross Island is thought by archaeologists such as Gibson and Fitzpatrick to have spread from Iberia also. So, that bell beaker culture is not a monolith, not genetically, not linguistically. Um, so it's, it's always reading between the lines here. There's, yeah, there's ongoing and upcoming research looking into, are there a few ambiguous samples? Do the results change if you were to remove those? And so on. But at the moment, the demonstration, that's the picture that, is most likely for Celtic linguistic origins from an archaeological perspective. But the whole language and genetics thing, of course, is extremely controversial. I am not actually happy with either of these. I don't think that these are good enough justifications for them, but they are the justifications that I've come up with. 
Um, if you're going to marry someone or have kids with them, usually you need to speak the same language with it, as them. Uh, there are also a couple of genetic studies. They were not autosomal, not next generation. It was uh, mitochondrial and Y chromosome. That was in the caucus, found that people speaking the same language in the caucus, they were genetically more similar than people who were in the same village but didn't speak the same language. So that's the, the pros, and here's the, the cons of that genetic language proxy. So obviously language isn't something you're born with. And um, this, is, this is one which is quite close to my heart. People who know lots of languages, I think that's something that I would love to know more about in prehistory. And if you're going to use that proxy rigidly, you're going to completely ignore that. So this is the bottom line really, it's of tentative legitimacy only. I wouldn't say that means you shouldn't use it. I think it should be used, as long as you understand those shortcomings. So um, this is a, a diagram of autosomal. It's a bit, it's a bit uh, crude, excuse that, but it does the job quite well. At the bottom are samples. Previously, you could only really look at one single lineage, mother, 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 on that maternal line. If you were lucky and had good preservation, you could do the same on the father's line. But now you can look at the whole genome, all of the ancestry, and that's given a whole lot of profound findings, a whole lot of good insights. Just to use a pun, this tool has been sharpened. If we are to simplify this, then that would be a tragedy. But if we were to ignore it, that would also be a tragedy. Archaeology would lose its status as a cardinal system to understand the past. Multidisciplinary approaches do make you quite vulnerable. If I'm just going to take somebody else's word as sacred, really, I need to, I need to understand why they say that. So if I've, if I've made mistakes about the genetics, maybe I have. I would love to know if I have. But um, I'm not a geneticist, so I've, ha I've made the effort to understand what I've told you about there. Um, that, that's a really good book which uh, illustrates the vulnerability. Archaeologists and linguists uh, were really promoting a few publications which were multidisciplinary, historical, linguistic and data science. And they promote the Anatolian hypothesis for uh, Indo-European spread and origins in both time and place. But they were deeply, deeply flawed. We can get into that more later. I recommend that publication. So some, will, some scientific papers will remain kind of non-archaeological almost, just in the supplementary. It's not, it's not ideal, really. There's a, a, you know, a saying, build bridges, not walls. Not everybody's going to go over the bridges, so, and I think that's okay. Everybody needs to do what they know how to do. And um, that's almost raw data, I suppose, some of these genetic papers. So this is a bit of fun, really. Um, I think we're in an excellent environment for debate. Rather than a kind of chess-like face-off, it's better sitting at a round table where everybody's skills are appreciated and not being too kind of a antagonistic to each other. Sometimes the debate ends in stalemate, impasse, and I think that's actually fine. Um, there is versions of Arthurian mythology where all the knights go off in different directions looking for the Holy Grail, and that's why I think a good kind of metaphor that all different sorts of archaeological methodologies should be utilised in the academy. Um, one thing I will say is there has been a, a few really, really admirable publications which saw people who disagreed with one another vehemently in the past have, have come to, not, not come to disagree, but they've put their differences aside for the matter of sharing their findings. And um, this is just a quick example of that. Um, I won't read it. Out. I won't read it out. But I can't emphasize enough how much I admire that, and how much I think that is important. I don't think that this sort of thing should have a monopoly on what's published in archaeological literature. But I think that this is definitely necessary in every field of prehistory.
So just to wrap up, there'll probably always be disagreements in the study of the human past and numerous ways of understanding the human past, but a relative eclectic and evidence-based toolbox approach offers archaeologists a method of navigating a diversity of styles, opinions and methods. Thanks for listening.